Uh, hi. Um, so I am Frank Olivier. Uh, my team works on all the uh, graphics uh, inside of the IE browser. Um, I've been doing this for a while, since uh, IE 9. Uh, that's three logo changes ago, so we keep losing colors in the IE logo. I have no idea where we're going next after one color. Um, so now is an interesting time to be working in a web browser. We have uh, more graphical options than ever when it comes to doing something on the web, uh, but you also have a wider variety of hardware than ever before. And the user's expectation really is that the web should work equally well across all these devices. That's very easy if you have a very nice high-end uh, desktop machine or very high, uh, high-end laptop machine. It gets much, much, much trickier when you have a uh, low-end low phone, low-power phone. So as a web browser developer, it's really, really tricky to go and enable this across all the hardware. And we do a couple of tricks that we'll, we'll go through. Uh, so just a quick roadmap of where we've uh, been and where, where we're going to. Uh, it's been a while since we came to, to uh, the graphical web. Uh, so I think the last time we were here was maybe IE9, which was shipped in 2011. That was the first version of IE that shipped uh, with GPU hardware acceleration. So everything that we draw on the screen that represents the web page, that's all done uh, on the GPU versus uh, via uh, DirectX or, or Direct2D APIs. And that really was uh, immediate mode rendering. So as your display tree changes, uh, we would re-render the, the relevant parts uh, constantly. But really what you want to get to, and we did this with IE10, is you want to get to uh, independent rendering or layered rendering. What this really is, is uh, you render into layers, you compose them together, and you save a lot of, uh, of rendering time on the GPU because you're not constantly re-rendering parts that perhaps haven't, haven't changed. So one of the interesting things that people are always a little bit surprised by is in an OS, you have your window manager, all of the windows are composed by a desktop uh, compositor or window manager. One of the interesting things about IE is that we actually use the, the OS window manager or the OS compositor to do all the content inside of IE. So it depends on content in the page, but for the most part, um, a lot of the divs and a lot of the SVG content, a lot of the video content, that's all just composed as, uh, as objects inside of, uh, of the OS window manager. Uh, you might see that if we have a bug inside IE where some of the content in IE might be actually outside the IE app window. So it's a fun, fun uh, bug to see. So the, work, the advantage you get from that uh, is that you really keep the UI thread, uh, the JavaScript thread, really uh, offloaded a lot. Uh, we have a very, very, very nice system where we have an OS animation engine that just takes uh, a bunch of animations and puts them outside the browser. Uh, we just queue up these animations in the engine outside of the IE process, and the animation engine and the OS compositor runs all that on all our behalf. We don't have to do anything to run those. It also means that we don't interrupt it at all. Even if we have a high JavaScript load or anything like that, there's no impact to the animations. Uh, the other nice part of this is that pannable and zoomable content is really, really nice and smooth. Again, there's not, nothing that we from the IE side can do to interrupt panning and zooming. Everything happens inside the OS. The OS tells us when the user has finished panning and zooming. And then another, another nice benefit, uh, this is my personal favorite, uh, is that you can go and optimize uh, certain content. So if you have content that changes a lot, like 2D canvas uh, or video or SVG filter effects, you can actually go and make that um, update really, really quick by isolating it in the UI, in the display tree. So for example, here we have a little cheesy little filter effect page, and you can see I'm doing mousing behind me. Uh, this is really, really hard when you're jet lagged. <laughs> so you can see you get a very nice uh, smooth 60 frames per second. Maybe we'll do this one. So you see very nice fast composition because we're running GPU filters just on one surface that just contains the, uh, the content that should be filtered. So 
Um, moving on, uh, we also get a couple of very nice HTML5 video benefits. Um, we don't actually handle any HTML5 video inside of IE. All that we basically do is when you tell us go put HTML video here on the page, is we go tell the OS uh, media engine, hey, here's the URL, please go and download the, the, the file, uh, parse the file, get the, get the video frames and it puts it inside the OS compositor. So we on the IE side, again, we can't do anything to mess up the frame rate of the video. It's a very nice benefit to a very, very nice, smooth video. Uh, depending on your perspective, there's also a great uh, DRM benefit here. Uh, if you have your OS uh, media engine handling video outside of your process, uh, it makes it much more secure when it comes to DRM video. And then there's also nice power benefits when you get to uh, to full screen video. When you full screen, uh, hit the full screen button in uh, IE video, the rest of the OS compositor actually shuts down and just the frontmost video co that covers up every pixel on the screen, only that is composed. So you actually save a bunch of GPU and battery time by just composing one layer. Uh, so it kind of gets interesting. There's a couple of scenarios where we actually pop out layers and bring back layers. So if you animate, for example, that circle through a bunch of other elements on the page, uh, we actually will pop out things into their own layer so you can go animate underneath the other elements and only pop them back in as, uh, as dependent elements. So we have a, a very tricky part of the stack that just pops in and out layers as you animate things or change things in your display tree. So. Uh, this is something we constantly change as the web changes. It's very, very tricky to go make a display tree and an independent rendering system that works for all the web content out there. Now, if you're a web developer, you say, well, how about I control the layering here? How about I give you some hints or some clues and, and I get to be the one who decides which layers should be independently composed and which ones should be just composed together. And there have been some hacks in the past here. You can do a CSS 3D transform with you know, zero, zero, zero. That gives you your own layer, but it's not really, you know, a, it's kind of a hack. Uh, there's a world change transform uh, proposal that's, that's going around. Uh, I'm in two minds about that. Uh, one of the nice things and tricky things as a web browser developer is that you kind of need to balance this, this, uh, this interaction between you and the web developer. The web developer can give you a lot more specific instructions at the render web page, or you could kind of sort of ensure that, hey, magic happens on behalf of the user. So when you have something as complex as a compositor, uh, it really is a bit of a long discussion. Who really should control how the display tree and the, and the compositor works exactly? It probably in the long run should be more on the web browser side rather than the developer side, because uh, as the OS advances, as the hardware advances, whatever specific instructions you give a web browser might change over time. So, uh, on to IE11. Um, shipped this in 2013 and we're still shipping it. Uh, we've been updating this every month, so every second Tuesday of the month we go update a couple of hundred million machines on the internet with the newest version of IE. <laughs> Uh, a couple of big graphics features in there. Uh, I'll talk about two of them. I'll talk about image memory optimization and WebGL uh, and Canvas too. Uh, so Canvas is one of the first things I worked on. Uh, it's my, one of my pet features. It's nice to see the Canvas spec is still uh, changing, getting new features. Uh, we spend a bunch of time making the image smoothing uh, when you draw uh, images scaled up in Canvas. We spend a bunch of time making that nice and cubically resampled and then we added image smoothing enabled equals false so you can now go make a little pixel art games with, with no image smoothing so it's funny as soon as you add something people want to do the other style uh, canvas full rule is also another nice one that's been added uh, this maps quite nicely to our image uh, uh, APIs inside uh, inside out windows uh, dash lines as well um, this is a very very nice uh, new feature which makes drawing Realistic maps much, much, much easier. But really, uh, one of the trickiest things we have to do is reduce the cost of text and images. That really is actually uh, the simplest things you'd think, but the trickiest things for us to go and optimize. Uh, so, uh, looking at all the images on the web, we wanted to go and see if we can reduce cost, uh, both uh, network cost and memory cost, GPU bandwidth cost for loading images. 
looking at all the images on the internet, about half of them are JPEGs, uh, and then JSON, JNG, the other almost 50%. The other 2%, uh, I think, are telemetry goose there, or that's cat pictures, I don't know. Um, so we looked into chroma subsampling. Uh, so as you store your images in GPU memory, usually, uh, you store them with uh, red, green, and blue channels, uh, 24 bits per pixel, usually. Uh, inside of a JPEG, uh, you don't really do that. Uh, usually, inside of a JPEG, you have your Luma channel, uh, your Grayscale channel, and your two Lumosity channels, your, uh, sorry, your two Chroma channels. So the interesting thing is that a fair number of JPEGs out there on the internet are actually um, Chroma subsampled. So the two Chroma channels are actually at lower resolution. Uh, that's how you get a bunch of the image compression benefits uh, in JPEG. Uh, so one of the big things we did in IE11 to save a bunch of uh, GPU memory and a bunch of uh, GPU bandwidth is to go and just upload uh, the lower resolution chroma channels up to the GPU. So instead of decoding the whole thing and uploading 24 bits per pixel red, green, blue channels up to the GPU, we just take the, uh, in the 420 case down there, we take the Luma channel, upload that, and the lower resolution chroma and chroma channel and we recompose that when we go and render the image. So that saves you a bunch of, of bandwidth, which on a low-end device is pretty useful. So looking at the timing for that, uh, IE10, uh, I think this is our averages we had. Uh, we went from 81 milliseconds down to 57 milliseconds to, to, to decode a Chroma subsample JPEG. So, it's nice to pile up all these tricks inside your device and get it faster without web developers having to do really very much. Uh, all that you have to do as a web developer, uh, and the UI here isn't fantastic, if you want to go save your uh, images with uh, Chroma subsampling uh, in Photoshop, quality 0 to 6 will get you there. Um, if you do save as web in Photoshop, uh, quality 0 to 50 gets you to Chroma subsampling. There really should be an independent uh, control in Photoshop, but it's not. There's also a couple of nice tools uh, that do this, although not many of the image optimization tools seem to do chroma subsampling. Uh, Riot is one of the nicer ones I've found, and this can just batch process a bunch of JPEGs on your site. And of course, you get a bunch of memory, uh, a bunch of network benefits here, as well as the, the GPU benefits. So one of the last things we worked on in IE was uh, WebGL. We started about a year ago, uh, more than a year ago now. Uh, we had some simple goals here. Uh, security, first and foremost, that's pretty much the first thing on the list for any feature inside the IE team. Uh, interoperability was another big one, and then breadth of hardware support. Uh, we really wanted to have the, a very similar uh, WebGL rendering experience across all devices. Um, our API support was mainly limited by time. We, we realized early on that we need to go ship uh, continuous updates to our WebGL renderer to get it uh, to full compliance. Uh, so we shipped the initial uh, version of this in November. And we've updated this uh, five times now. This slide is out of date. We just slipped, shipped the last update uh, last week, Tuesday. So we are on all IE 11 devices. Um, it's fantastic to see all the WebGL content just light up inside the IE browser. It's also a very, very nice way for us to discover interoperability issues inside of IE because a lot of the WebGL content out there was written with the idea that IE would never actually run that WebGL content. Um, one of the other things we've noticed is that uh, a lot of the mobile devices, uh, there's really no WebGL content for you. So it's actually kind of interesting that um, that isn't a big thing on the web yet. Uh, we'd love to see more, more mobile WebGL content, uh, whether it is uh, writing content for lower end GPUs or just handling touch input. People don't seem to be doing that as much on the mobile web yet. I'll go quickly through our stack uh, for WebGL and IE11. Uh, we, of course, are a DirectX based browser. Uh, some Windows machines have OpenGL drivers uh, on the machine. Uh, we don't use those. We go and take everything uh, and convert it through to DirectX equivalents. So you give us uh, DirectX context calls, we convert those into, sorry, you give us uh, 
WebGL context API calls. We go and convert those into direct equivalents. And we can also go take your GLSL, uh, your GPU code, and can convert that into HLSL. And we have a fairly complex and intricate uh, shader compilation pipeline. We we'll actually go and uh, reconstruct your entire ASD tree back into HLSL. So none of the actual source code you give us gets uh, transferred over to the GPU. We reconstruct everything. So that gives us some interesting problems. Um, if you're familiar with uh, shader programming, uh, one of the interesting things is that there's a, a big difference between GLSL and HLSL when it comes to uh, selection operators. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, basically a shorthand for if A or else C. Um, so in GLSL, uh, A must be a Boolean scalar. So if I can see, uh, you basically say, you basically execute either A, uh, either B or C. Uh, in Windows, in HLSL, uh, you don't get that. We execute both sides, both B and C, which seems a little bit crazy. Uh, the reason why is because uh, it really is a vector operation. So you could write this in HLSL. It's entirely valid. You can go and reconstruct, uh, or you can go and construct a vector. And that's why we actually go and evaluate both sides of this. So you can't really map between these two constructs in GLSL and HLSL. It doesn't really quite work very well. Uh, so the solution really is to go and inject uh, a new function at each place where we need to go and do this, this mapping. And it gets fairly complex to the scoping. But uh, this is a level of uh, reconstruction you have to go do to convert between GLSL and HLSL. Uh, another big thing that we found, which is kind of interesting, uh, the security promises between uh, the OpenGL stack and the WebGL stack uh, and the DirectX stack is a little bit different. Uh, on DirectX 10 plus hardware, we actually in enforce on the driver and hardware side that all your vertex and attribute buffers uh, are, are valid. Um, so you can't create a buffer and upload it that uh, doesn't really uh, have have security issues. So this is one of the reasons why we worked with, uh, with Kronos. We joined Kronos and we'd like to do some spec contributions here to see if we can, can change how we do uh, buffer uploads. So time for a demo. Uh, one of the other nice things about having WebGL in the browser is working with our teams at Microsoft and constructing WebGL content uh, inside of Microsoft. We have a fair number of teams publishing WebGL content. Uh, this is a demo from our, our MSR team where uh, they stitch together a bunch of photos and create a, a 3D model. So I think this is about 20 or 25 photos that have been stitched together to make a fairly decent 3D model. You can see it's not perfect, but it's kind of interesting how well you can reconstruct this boat. So it'll be interesting to see how this, what this does for this kind of thing, what this will do for e-commerce. I'd almost buy this boat sight unseen. So, like I said, we shipped the spring update to the WebGL renderer. Uh, we're still working on more updates. Uh, we just shipped one last Tuesday. Um, and we're pretty much almost done with, with our WebGL 1.0 spec. Uh, we're at 97% compliance now when it comes to the Kronos test suite. Uh, when it comes to best practices, uh, we still see a lot of uh, content on the web uh, that is aimed at high-end machines only. That's one of the problems, I think, right now with WebGL. Uh, if you make WebGL content, please test on a variety of machines. Um, there are some GPU differences. There are a lot of GPU speed differences. Uh, you don't see very many people tuning their content for different levels. Um, and then the other big ones, which we always see, please use request animation frame, uh, please don't render in background tabs, uh, and please don't render if the scene isn't changing. We see a lot of, of, of content that just renders the same pixels over and over and over again. Uh, the other interesting thing too is we see a lot of uh, frameworks, really. Uh, I think more than half the WebGL content that we've seen uses a framework like, uh, like 3GS. Uh, some new ones are also springing up, like Babylon JS, which one of my colleagues at Microsoft works on. Uh, and 
again backwards mousing. One of the nice things about uh, Babylon JS is that it makes it fairly easy to go and uh, get content from, I think in this case it's 3ds Max, and put that inside the browser. So this seems to be a, a big theme now with WebGL where you take content that was created elsewhere and you have a very, very, very easy publishing path out to, out to the web. That's good on the one hand because you get all these really good professional tools that enable now a nice big flow out to the web. But on the other hand, it's kind of sad that we don't no longer have uh, you know, web uh, development just through uh, the text editor. Okay, and then one last topic before lunch. Uh, we've got some recent challenges in the mobile web. Um, we've looked into um, how the mobile web differs from the desktop web. Um, and we had some surprising findings. Uh, we were able to actually improve our rendering on 40% of the mobile websites by really just doing two things. Um, the desktop web is uh, the desktop web. The desktop web is fairly standards based. The mobile web seems to be a bit more challenging. Uh, we've seen a fair number of websites where, uh, if you're not a WebKit based browser you get a very, very, very generic version of a mobile website, uh, or you get a desktop version of a website. And uh, that's a shame, but that is the way the mobile web is today. Uh, in this example, uh, if you're not uh, either like Android or like iPhone in your UA string, then you get a desktop version. And this is a fairly pervasive problem on the mobile web, unfortunately. So in our last uh, Windows Phone update, uh, we changed our UA string, I think that's the not exactly the latest version of it, but we changed our, our UA string to contain like Android and like iPhone. Uh, that's one of the things you have to do to get good mobile content. Um, somebody in the W3C once uh, mentioned that the, the UA string is an ever-growing pack of lies. It's probably not a bad way to characterize it. Um, so once you do that, uh, you start delving into WebKit CSS. We've seen a lot of content that only has uh, prefixed markup. And uh, you really have to go and, and handle that CSS. This is a fairly benign example, but you really have to go handle all the, the WebKit-based CSS in your browser to get good content. And the interesting thing was you even get the old, old, old version of the WebKit uh, markup here. So there's the pre-W3 prefix version is still in very, very common use on the web. And it's interesting because it seems to be a lot of copy and pasting that happens uh, without the web developer really reading the spec behind it. So the solution for us here is to go and map these prefix versions over into our standards-based un unprefixed equivalents and also have a dev tool warning that just says, hey, by the way, there's no uh, prefixed equivalent, uh, unprefixed equivalent for the CSS. Another fairly common one, uh, a lot of uh, web developers want to take away all the OS control styling. So in this case of Groupon.com, there's a little drop down arrow that people want to remove. Um, it makes the site look a lot cleaner and nicer. So WebKit appearance none is a pretty prevalent thing on the web. Um, so to make your content look nicer and cleaner, that's one of the big things that we have to go do. Um, this is probably a better example of the kind of restyling people do. Uh, on this dating website, uh, you couldn't really successfully sign up on Windows Phone because uh, if you look at the gender on the left there, uh, that was being restyled to a male or female icon. So, pretty important change. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, one of the tricky things uh, that we found is font handling on the mobile web seems to be different than on the desktop web. Um, on the desktop web, we go and check the chorus header and we go and check the, the fonts installed a little bit. Um, on the mobile web, in some sites, uh, the expectation is that you don't have to go do that. So you'll see a bunch of, uh, of icon fonts, like in this case, I think this is a font called Font Awesome. Uh, and if you don't, if you fully follow, fully follow the spec here, you don't actually get the right content. So this is a case where we have a W3C discussion uh, in this case where the spec doesn't actually quite reflect what content is actually doing on the web. 
So uh, that's that's it. Uh, the next thing really is just what's next. Um, that's why I'm here. I'd love to hear from everybody here to see what we're doing well, what we're not doing well in the IE team. Um, please, over the next couple of days, give me a bunch of feedback. Thanks. Well, I guess I'll take questions. All right, we've got time for a few questions. Anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Come on, come on, not all at once, come on. I've got a question. Sure. Um, why is it you think that um, SVG is so fast in IE9, 10 and 11? <laughs> Good question for the other browser vendors. I'll take the microphone. Uh, good question. Uh, it's one of the first things we did when we did hardware acceleration uh, because we kind of did it off to the side compared to uh, the main renderer. So it's probably because it's the newest one, I'd guess. Good answer. Come on. Somebody else has another question. Yes. Um, Michael Sornby, uh, Met Office. Do you have any sort of plans, projections that you're working to in, in terms of how fast you think browsers are going to get? Because you know, obviously we work with supercomputers and all sorts of tech, and one of the things that I've noticed is that, if anything, browser performance seems to be the thing that's moving fastest. The last couple of years has moved faster than anything else. You know, if you want to see your code speed up, then mm -hmm. you know, somehow get it in the browser and you'll, you'll see it get faster and faster. But are we, are we going to see much more of that, or, or is it going to max out soon? Oh, okay. Tall people problems. Uh, so this is the one of those tall people problems you have to, you have to fix. Um, so one of the problems, one of the, the, the good things there is uh, we're in the second browser war, which is fantastic for, um, for people who make content. Um, absolutely, I think content will just get faster and faster and faster in the next couple of years, especially with the focus on, on mobile too. A lot of the tricks here uh, make content run acceptably well on mobile devices, and it just completely helps out a huge amount on uh, on desktop devices too. So absolutely, I think you'll you'll just see it uh, get faster and faster in the future. Okay. Anyone else have another question? Well, while you think of a question, I have one question. Sure. Since you shift the JPEG from RGB to YCBCR onto the GPU, one of the things we've seen is. Uh, differences in color correction in browsers, like Safari, very different to Firefox, mm -hmm. different to Chrome as well. So are you doing anything with color correction on the GPU? Uh, not yet. We have a very good API uh, in Windows for doing that, but we're not using it. Uh, we actually had a build of IE with color correction turned on, uh, and there was a big discussion over should speed win out there or should color fidelity win out there. And it's a tricky discussion because on tablets and mobile phones, people don't really care as much about color fidelity. You're using your phone, God knows where, in bright sunlight or in a subway tunnel. So color fidelity is kind of a tricky problem there. Uh, on the desktop web, uh, we didn't enable it because a lot of the uh, monitors out there are, are barely correctly sRGB calibrated. So uh, it's one of those things where we are not optimizing the prosumer side of things. Uh, we probably have some more work to do to go and make the, the average ecosystem, the average user in the ecosystem, uh, have a bit better experience first. Right. Brian, are you stretching or have you got a question? <laughs> <laughs> ah, Cyril. Hi. Uh, continuing on this YCBCR question, um, do you envisage other uh, other um, process to move to this YCBCR uh, space, or like I, mean, I don't know, Canvas or stuff like that, generated um, in that space? Perhaps. I mean, video already. The the, the YCBCR trick is really a, a video <laughs> video encoding decoding trick, right? Um, yeah, perhaps Canvas or, or WebGL could benefit from, from something like this, right? Uh, you might want to render WebGL content uh, with uh, a high fidelity chroma channel and then just do a little bit different lower resolution coloring. Um, perhaps. I mean, it would be interesting to see what people do with this trick. 
Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, there are not a lot of WebGL examples out there to, to test, and uh, I think you uh, can expect a lot of uh, new content in the Geo, Geo community, because uh, there is now a lot of laser scanning uh, data mm -hmm. collected, and uh, there is also efforts uh, uh, may, uh, uh, similar to the uh, Google Earth uh, browser-based uh, version. And there will be more content for virtual globes out there in the future, I think. Yeah, it's, it's uh, if, you, if you're interested, I can put you in touch with uh, some people in the US who do, uh, do a WebGL-based uh, last tool viewer for laser mm. scanning data. I, I'd, lo I I'd love to see that. I can forward you the, uh, the contact. Y yes, please. I'd love to see that. It's amazing to see the, the data sets these days that people are pumping through the browser. There was a... I think a seven million point laser scan that I loaded up the other day, and it works, right? It's, it streams in higher and lower resolution parts of the image, but it's amazing that it's just now something and you can just do in the browser. We're also working with uh, some larger like aerospace companies, for example, where a couple of years ago, they had to go and send around like gigantic CAD files around the world. And these days they basically like email a URL to you know, the office in Brazil. <laughs> and they just stream in whatever parts of the, of the, the CAD drawing they need. So it's amazing that we're at, we're at that point with, with the browsers. I had heard a rumor that uh, Microsoft might be softening their perspective on something very near and dear to the SVG community, which is Smile. Uh, hmm. do you, is that possible? Um, it's been a little bit since we looked at Smile. Um, I think there's a, there's a need uh, to maybe combine all the various uh, animation uh, systems we have on the web. Uh, one of the challenges that I think we have right now is that SVG and HTML is a little bit different, and they really shouldn't be. Uh, it would be really nice if they could be a little bit more... Uh, I don't know the right word for that, but it would be nice if, uh, if we had one animation system, for example, and one filter system, and, you know, and so on. Um, that'll probably take a long time to do, um, but I think that's probably the, the direction we'll, we'll go. All right, shameless plug for Brian's talk tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> I think that's probably enough questions for now. Can we thank Frank again for uh, his great presentation? Thank you.